In Central Asia, the migration of peoples isn't over. From here, Huns and Mongols embarked on the adventure of world conquest. From here, for centuries, the world order of Asia and Europe was turned upside down. The key to the success of these nations of riders was their mobility. The historian Herodotus considered the steppe nomads invincible. He wrote, people who carry their homes with them, all of them archers on horseback, who live not from farming but from animal husbandry are difficult to catch. A Mongolian proverb says, travel by considering in advance provisions, fodder and water for your horse. Setting off, arriving, moving on. A caravan of Tuvinians, members of a Mongolian tribe, on their way back to their old homeland. Mass migration, as in the days of Genghis Khan. For the nomads of today, an adventure. On horseback, the Mongols forged the biggest empire the world has ever seen. On horseback, these young Tuvinians feel part of their history. With them, they have everything they treasure or need. The idea for this migration with horses and camels came from the leader of the caravan, the Tuvinian writer Galsan Chinag. He wrote many of his novels in German. Buying horses en route, he shows a Mongol flair for patient bargaining. I was born in the year of the horse. For that reason alone, I felt a commitment towards horses all my life. But as a member of a nation of horsemen, as a member of a nomadic Mongol tribe, I also feel that horses are actually part of me, physically and spiritually. Part of the landscape, Chevalsky's horse, which the Mongolians called Tachi. Here in the remote wilderness of the Dzungarian desert, the last living ancestors of the modern horse were found. Since the mid-60s, Chevalskys have been considered extinct in the wild, but in the Tachi Valley, they're to be re-established. And it's all thanks to the German zoo founder, Karl Hagenbeck. Almost a hundred years ago, he brought 39 wild Chevalskys to Western Europe. That herd formed the breeding stock for today's entire worldwide population of over 1,800 animals. He said goodbye to his catchers with instructions to bring them home safely. And that is the wish that now accompanies the six stallions on the way back to their roots. Flight LH-720. Releasing animals into the wild in the jet age. 
compared with the rigours of the journey in the last century, today's Chowalskis travel like pampered pets. The Mongolians are pleased. Proudly, they wait for their tachyons. Deliberately reared as wild animals, they have to be transported in sturdy crates. Only if they're wary and tough will they stand a chance of surviving in the wilderness. The Mongolian release program was initiated by the Christian Oswald Foundation in Germany. The six stallions are a gift by the Stamm Foundation for the preservation of rare single-toed animals. Imported stock bred all over the world will help to maintain the genetic diversity of the Trawalski horses in the Tachy Valley in future. The road to freedom is long. First, the animals need to become acclimatized in special paddocks. Next, they move into this 160 hectare enclosure. Then, after about two years, the fence finally opens. To ensure that they find their new territory around an oasis, hay is used to lure them further and further away. Sirius is a stallion from a breeding station in Switzerland. His seed will help form the group of strong, vigorous young males who will eventually take the place of the old stallions. Long, icy winters, heat and sandstorms in summer, scant food and exposure to hungry packs of wolves. That is the price of freedom for these horses. Initial contacts. Sirius forms a new breeding group with these mares from Australia. Thanks to genetic programming, they soon feel at home in their new environment. No life without water. The Tachy Valley has been declared a nature reserve. If they had to compete with human beings, the wild horses wouldn't stand a chance. At certain times of the year, nomads traverse this terrain, stopping at as many as 10 different grazing sites. So there was a clash of interests here. In dry years, the wild horses competed with the livestock for food. In addition, the wild tachy stallions stole mares from the herd, which enraged the lead stallions and caused frequent fights to the death. The herdsmen hunted the wild horses, and they were brought to the brink of extinction. To be successful today, the release program needs the full acceptance and support of the nomads of the region. How has their attitude to the wild horses changed? We are proud that the Takis have returned to our land. They're an adornment for our country. Mongolian society today. Genghis Khan is again revered as the great Mongol leader. With the advent of the market economy, Mongolians are again on the move. They head with their herds for the capital, Ulaanbaatar, to be close to the markets. Socialism brought cities of concrete. Today, thousands of cars are imported each year. But horses are still a familiar sight in the city. The history of Mongolia and the Mongolians is a history of horsemen. Horses as motifs in art. The horse as an emblem.
In the Second World War, millions of Mongolian horses carried Russian soldiers all the way to Berlin. Horses as a strategic weapon. Speed, surprise, mobility. These were the keys to the Mongolian cavalry forces' military success. They rode their horses ruthlessly till they dropped. The tortoise, a symbol of constancy and immortality. They have remained. Marco Polo described the old Mongolian capital of Karakorum as ostentatiously rich. The yurt of the Khans was huge, like a circus tent. This is where Genghis Khan's grandsons held court. In 1264, Kublai Khan moved his capital to Beijing. Communication as a means of power. Messengers carried their news in their heads to ensure that secrets wouldn't fall into the wrong hands. Bandaged to protect against the rasping saddle, they rode day and night. It took them eight days to get to Europe. Endowed with special privileges, they were answerable only to the great Khan. The best horses were always reserved for them. The distance between staging posts was around 30 kilometers, the distance a horse could cover at full gallop. Life on arrival at the summer pastures. This is Bayan Jagar, an Oyash, a racehorse trainer. Setting up the yurts, the gare, as they're called in Mongolia. The tents are light but strong. Six sliding lattice walls form the perimeter, which has a diameter of about eight meters. Sheets of felt provide protection against night frosts. Setting up camp takes barely two hours. Nomads travel light. The time has come to prepare for the Nadam festival. The racehorses, which lead a semi-wild existence in the mountains, first have to be rounded up. As though it was the easiest thing in the world, the riders shift from one thigh to another. They almost stand in the saddle. No matter how the horse moves, they're never caught off balance. Bayan Jagal, the head of the family, drives the yaks to the milking place. Despite routine chores and the extra work for the festival, the weeks before the Nardam are a time of peace and contemplation for the whole family. Even the youngest helped drive the animals. He was just four when he got his first horse. The grandfather. This family is wealthy. Elsewhere, they'd be described as the owners of around 300 horses. They say, we own 10 stallions, which everyone knows means 10 free-ranging breeding groups, each comprising about 30 animals. The racehorses are caught with an orga, a rod lasso. The moment the noose is round their neck, the rider sits down behind the saddle. The Mongolians distinguish between herd horses, lassoing horses, war horses and race horses, which are also used for travelling. The horses are lean. Although it's already mid-June, there's still no fresh grass. That's why they spend longer than usual in the Gobi Desert. After the winter, the withered grass there is particularly rich in protein. 
The people here don't go in for storing fodder. The horses run their first race as yearlings. This year, they're put through just 15 days of training. If they're fat from eating spring grass, more than four weeks is spent on getting them into shape. A central role in the proceedings is played by the Morin Oya, the tethering frame. The Urga is blessed. It's more than just a tool. For the first time this year, the foals are captured and the process of taming them begins. Horses may enjoy absolute freedom in the herds, but the young are rigorously subjugated from the start. From now on, the foals have to share with people. <coughs> Tethered low, they can't reach the mother's udder. The wandering Buddhist Lama prays for the herds, prays for lots of milk. In summer, also called the white months, the people here eat lots of dairy products. Mare's milk, fermented into the mildly alcoholic Iraq, is the Mongolian's national drink. Bodily contact with the foal makes milking easier. It gets the milk flowing. Then, human hands take over. The warbling noises are intended to make the milk flow more freely. From six milkings a day, the average yield is two litres. Mare's milk is also added to the racehorse's food. Only when the horse's tails have been bound are they real Nadam horses. The binding also makes them easier to identify when they're rounded up in the morning. Bayan Jagal used to be employed as a horse breeder and trainer and he was very successful. After privatization, he built up his own herds and keeps his animals in the nomad tradition. How does he feel about horses? Horses are the animals I respect and admire most of all. That's why I've devoted my life to them. Of the five kinds of livestock, they take first place. When I see to the animals, I attend to them even before the sheep. Horses, as everyone knows, are a Mongolian's most treasured possession. Training starts late in the afternoon. For 10 hours now, the horses have been standing at the moor in Oya without food, without water. Everything's kept as light as possible. The smaller the jockeys, the better the chances of winning. This yearling was broken in two weeks ago. With young animals, it's easy to nip resistance in the bud. Walking to warm up. Nearby horses also join in. A brush and a knife made of pelican bill. These are the Oyach's tools. Good yearlings are the pride of every breeder. Selecting them is an art. The acid test is the first thousand meter gallop. Livestock farming here is not intensive. Breeding is left more or less to chance. 
No one knows which stallion sired these animals. Even if it's dry, the horse is rubbed down. This is always done in the same way to put the horse at ease. After the last milking of the day, the foals have been tethered for 12 hours. Life here is hard. The horses stay small. Reaching an average height of only 1 meter 40, they're well adapted to cope with icy winters. To help counter the emotional stress of the day, the horses spend the nights with the herd. Every morning it's the same spectacle. Sweating off the pounds to produce a lean racer with stamina for the forthcoming contest. These methods have been used for training horses for centuries, as historical veterinary records show. The half hour spent trotting is intended to open up their paws. The first sweat, the lather, shows an experienced Oyach how he needs to shape his training program. Every day, the distance to be covered is increased by 200 meters. The grass step reaches far beyond the horizon, as far as a horse's hooves will carry it. Cranes are a sign of good luck in a pasture, so it's hardly surprising that Mongols respect them. Take raw leather from a cow hide that has been slowly dried. Cut it into narrow strips and rub in plenty of sheep's fat. Get ready-made bits in town, suitable for any horse. Tie a few knots, make a few twists, and you have a perfectly good bridle. These people are totally self-sufficient. The herds supply everything they need, including nermel, a spirit from fermented cow's milk, which is served to guests. In the Nardam season, the family lead a quiet existence. For the first time, a girl joins in. Sweating off under a blanket works like a sauna. Uphill and down dale, a six kilometer trot improves basic fitness. With sweat still in its body, a horse can't jump. But when the sweat flows freely, it'll gallop till it drops, says Bayandragal. After cooling off, the horses are tethered again till late in the evening, without being given anything to drink. The short, greasy wool is beaten into felt. Mutton forms the staple diet here. The sheep aren't slaughtered until they're several years old and fat. In this sparsely populated land, people are good neighbors and help one another. When the day's work is done, they eat konimach, noodle soup with meat. No bone is put down until it's been picked absolutely clean.
For the horses, riding sessions start on empty stomachs and empty bowels. There are four training periods every year. In the spring, they spend two weeks sweating off every day to make the muscles firm. Then in the summer, extensive training for the nadam. In the autumn, they have to walk longer distances to shed fat. Work in winter serves to toughen them up. They're tethered while still sweating in temperatures of minus 40 degrees and below. Between these phases, the horses have almost 10 months of freedom. The children dream of becoming a great oyach themselves one day. And they encourage one another because they want their horses to give all they've got. Mongolian jockeys are aged between 7 and 12. Onwards, always onwards. That's the only tactic, onwards. But that's it for today. The company of the herd is more important to them than the water in the nearby stream. Time out, a chance to compare notes. Snuff boxes are handed round. For centuries, knowledge of horses has been passed on here by word of mouth. The rulers of ancient China utilized this expertise. They had their cavalry trained by Mongolian oyaches. They all want to know what their horse is capable of and what their chances are of winning. The horses have to look their best. Tomorrow, the religious part of the preparations will begin. Also on the agenda, a 20 kilometer ride, followed by a short race at the place where they spend the night. Early in the morning, the Buddhist lamas start their litany. The original religious character of the Nadam festival is being revived. At this obo, a place deemed sacred throughout the region, there's also room for adherence of the animist religion, shamanism. Today, the two religions treat one another with tolerance. The faithful pray for good luck and health. After three rounds of the obo, the yearlings have a great future. a priest on the religious significance of horses in shamanism. We shamans say that even the gods, when they descend from heaven to earth, ride a horse. Buddhism and shamanism. Both religions revere horses. And what role do horses play in Lamaism? The reason why the horses are so highly regarded by God and why horse races are staged in the first place is that the only thing that can reach the world of the gods beyond the solar system is the dust of race horses. And when the dust of the racehorses reaches the world of the gods, there is peace, good fortune and prosperity in the mortal world. Only since the political turnaround have the dust clouds of the Obo Nadam started swirling again. Under communism, the Nadam was reduced to a purely secular sporting event. Vyandragar regards these races in the Mongolian outback 
as a test for the great Nardam in the provincial capital. The horse head violin, the most popular Mongolian musical instrument. In epic songs, the horse is a helper and advisor equal in stature to the hero. On the way to the wedding of a nephew, they have saddled up two five-gated horses for the journey. Normally, they'd use geldings. The bridal couple have decided on a van, a sign of changing times. Old stories tell of brides who followed their husbands only after fighting them on horseback to show they were an equal match. The marriage is sealed with Iraq. The saddle is of wood with staghorn trim. Saddles are objects of prestige and often more expensive than the horse itself. Family jewellery, the silver fittings handed down from one generation to the next. A new saddle is a real event. By Andragal's mother has come to help. To Mongolians, the figure of the mother represents the beginning. She is the earth. All new things need a mother's blessing. In nomad society, the woman's role is based on equality. Couples here call themselves nöcha, companions. All the same, women have to walk a step behind their men, and they don't get the best pieces of meat. Both sexes are at home in the saddle, and in the Nadam, both girls and boys race for victory. Genghis Khan, whom the Mongolians today still regard as an authority on many matters of behavior, often turned to his mother and wives for advice on important issues. It's always the mother who has the honor of mounting up first. The youngest son stays with his mother and looks after her livestock. Incredible as it seems, they come of their own accord. Horses are creatures of habit. This stallion is his most successful racehorse. It's the covering season, so he's given an easier time training. None of the horses has a name, not even this prize male. <laughs> a second stallion training, but his performance is disappointing, his strength sapped by a night with the mares. Grazing, the herds move on through the mountains. By the following morning, they've often covered 10 kilometers and have to be driven back. Ah! 
Among his own two-year-olds, this man didn't have a single promising racehorse. So when he saw this one, he bought it, and now he's pinning high hopes on it. This is an eight-year-old, one which has already proved its mettle. Last year, it won first prize, a motorcycle. I think its external features aren't bad. Look at its withers, its head, its stomach is big, the body well-formed. A Mongolian description. As regards the horse, the mount, the wind stallion he was wont to ride, it was broad of forehead, strong of muscle. Its eyebrows were thick, its ears like llama bells, its tail bushy, and it had speed in its sinews. It sometimes had 71 speeds, and otherwise it possessed 82 magic forces. It wasn't a horse, it was something made of crystal jewels. A good start is crucial and has to be practiced because a lot is decided then. Walk, turn round and away. The newly acquired racehorse is tied up with an old gelding to ensure that it doesn't make off just before the nadam. Chagai, a horse race with sheep's bones. The bone dice have four sides. Each side stands for a domestic animal. If a player throws a horse, he can move his figure forward. The track can be any length. Players advance bone by bone to the finish. Final training in the summer pastures. Every year, on July the 10th, they all set out. It's 60 kilometers to Uliasta, the capital of Zahwan province. A region of 100,000 people and over two and a quarter million animals. The campsite is chosen because of its herds. The night before the race, the animals are allowed to graze for only two hours. They need to start the race with an empty stomach. The Nardam Games. Riding, wrestling, archery. a test of strength. Genghis Khan's warriors loosed arrows at the enemy with deadly accuracy from galloping mounts. Today, in this sporting contest, the arrows are fired at a target on the ground. The distance? About 60 meters. They rode into war with black horse hair on their banner. White horse hair was a sign of peace. The three games of the men.
In Mongolia, there's a saying, a child stays with his mother until his feet reach the stirrups and his hand the pommel. The opening speech by the governor. In the Mongolian capital, Ulaanbaatar, it's the president of the country himself who opens the Nadam. Some participants coming together outside town. Tightly bunched, the yearlings set off on the five kilometer long track. On the final straight, they're drawing on their last reserves of strength. With well over two million horses in Mongolia, one horse is easily lost in the crowd. Here, the first five past the post are declared winners. And for the yearlings, there's a special prize, a full stomach award. Everyone sees it as a joke. But all the same, the slowest horse in this race receives the same prize as the fastest. Getting ready for the two-year-old's race. Now the newly acquired animal has to show what it can do. The best horses in the region are at the start. A hundred horses a race is quite normal. Six kilometers, uphill almost all the way. <laughs> Bayanjagal's spontaneous decision to buy this chestnut confirms his good eye for horses. It crosses the line a winner. In the following races, he has three more horses among the first five. Back into town, to the stadium. The final of the wrestling the main attraction for the spectators. There's no time limit on these wrestling bouts, but as soon as a contestant touches the ground with any part of his body above the knee, he's lost. The prize for wrestling and for archery is, of course, a horse. the most successful trainer. By Andragal blesses his racers with a sacrifice of milk. Now they're called Iraq horses. Medals, money prizes, and an old tradition, a song of praise for the winners, the horses, their riders, and the Oyach. In the meantime, the Tuvinians have covered a thousand kilometers. Man and horse are not sedentary beings. Man and horse are nomads. Moving, eating, moving on, protecting and protected in the herd. That is the natural way of life of horses. Horses never set out with some distant destination in mind. Their life is governed by the seasons and availability of food. 
Man's life, too, used to be geared to the same natural cycle. He followed the herds as a hunter, later as a breeder. The children live with the animals and from the animals, something that here is taken for granted. When they move on, they travel only in their best clothes. Daily life in the caravan binds families together. They rediscover things that had long been forgotten. At the top of the pass, an obol. It's a landmark, a boundary, a mystical place. The skull of a favorite horse, picked clean by the owner himself. money offerings to the spirits, requests for their protection. The faithful walk round the obo three times and ask for a safe journey. For the Tuvinians on their 2,000 kilometer trek, every obo is a mark of progress on their spiritual journey to a new future. Each day, the caravan advances 50 kilometers, crossing mountains, rivers, and rocky deserts. The soles of the camel's feet have become thin their unshod hooves scuffed and worn. regular, recurring rhythm of nomadic life. The search for a place for the night, setting up camp, and the need for peace and quiet and security.